the Battle of Fredericksburg. Historians view it as an awesome display of the power of weapons over antiquated tactics, the cradle of new styles of combat. But for the men on the ground, the Battle of Fredericksburg was one of the most ghastly episodes of human carnage ever on American soil. Relive the ordeal of Fredericksburg in an entirely new way. Through state-of-the-art computer animation, and unique views from every point on the battlefield. Now, discover that the truth can only be seen from all sides. November 10th, 1862. The second year of the American Civil War is drawing to a bloody close. And the Union Army has suffered a string of disastrous defeats. President Abraham Lincoln is furious with his generals and pressures them for a decisive Union victory. He awards command of the Army of the Potomac to inexperienced General Ambrose Burnside. Confederate General Robert E. Lee knows the Union is ready to attack, but he doesn't know where. The stage is now set for one of the most horrific episodes in American military history. General Burnside reluctantly takes his command after Lincoln fires George McClellan. Burnside is uncomfortable with the assignment. I think Burnside just realized he didn't have the brilliance necessary to be a great commander. He was a man of moderate intelligence, only limited experience, and I think he realized that this was a huge responsibility, bigger than any military responsibility that any other American general had ever shouldered before. Meanwhile, Confederate General Lee analyzes the impact of McClellan's dismissal and struggles to predict the Union's next move. He knew quite well that McClellan wasn't relieved due to incompetency. He was relieved due to inactivity. And he knew full well that the next guy, whoever it was going to be, was going to get pressured by Washington to move and move now. Under intense pressure from President Lincoln to act, General Burnside sets his sights on the Confederate capital at Richmond. To reach the city, he will march his army of more than 100,000 men south from Northern Virginia. Along the route, he must take Fredericksburg, a small unfortified rail and river junction in central Virginia. Fredericksburg was extremely important because it had a railroad that ran from north to south. It ran from the Potomac River all the way to Richmond. It was a surefire way that the army could get reinforcements. It could get supplies no matter what the weather was. So it was a perfect way to keep going and driving on to Richmond. On November 17th, Burnside's army reaches the banks of the Rappahannock River, just 400 feet across from Fredericksburg. But they have no way to get across. Burnside is irate. A week earlier, he had ordered pontoon bridges to be sent ahead for the crossing. Pontoon bridges were a low-tech wonder. They were 30-foot-long boats that would be anchored in a river, and then they would be lashed together, and then planks would be laid across them and lashed together, held together with basically boards and ropes. But once built, these were amazingly sturdy devices. You could march large numbers of men across them. You could bring artillery pieces across them. Cavalry could cross them. But there's been a mix-up in Washington. The pontoon bridges are still days away. At that point, Burnside has to make a decision. Does he take a risk and try to cross his army over the river without the pontoons, or should he wait and take the safer course and wait for those pontoon bridges to reach him? Fearing that his army could be cut off from supplies and heavy weapons if they forded the Rappahannock without bridges, Burnside decides that he and his troops will wait. On the Confederate side of the river, the city of Fredericksburg is virtually defenseless. No one anticipated an attack here, so the town hasn't been fortified. 
No artillery has been positioned. And only a handful of Confederate troops are stationed in the city. The rebels quickly dispatch a messenger to General Lee's headquarters 30 miles away in Orange, Virginia. Lee is shocked by the news of the appearance of the Federal Army outside the city. Robert E. Lee was surprised when the Union Army showed up at Fredericksburg. Uh, he was completely unprepared for it. His initial impression was that once the Union Army had gotten to Fredericksburg, there was nothing he could do to stop them from crossing the river and taking the city. Caught out of position, Lee orders elements of his Confederate Army First Corps under General James Longstreet to rush to Fredericksburg to intercept Burnside's advancing army. When he arrives, Longstreet is surprised to find the Union troops haven't crossed the river. So he digs in, fortifies the hills around Fredericksburg, and moves his troops into position. Now, 40,000 Confederate troops occupy a strong position in the Heights and a seven-mile ridgeline behind the town, while 100,000 Union troops wait for orders from General Burnside to cross the Rappahannock River. General Lee quickly arrives and sets up his command tent on Telegraph Hill in Heights above the town. He waits for Burnside to make the first move. Lee believes the troop buildup across the Rappahannock is merely a diversion. Given his superior defensive position around the town, Lee assumes that Burnside will not strike in Fredericksburg. Meanwhile, across the river, Burnside sets up his headquarters in a commandeered mansion and waits nervously for the pontoon bridges. President Lincoln rushes to Virginia to meet with Burnside. He trusts his general to devise a strategy as long as he acts fast. Finally, a week later, the disassembled bridges arrive. But having lost the element of surprise, Burnside is paralyzed with indecision. His troops know they've missed their opportunity. If we had had the pontoons promise when we arrived here, we could have the hills on the other side of the river without the cost of over 50 men. Now it will cost at least 10,000, if not more. On December 9th, Ambrose Burnside calls his commanders together and outlines a risky plan. He brashly proposes crossing the river and launching a dual frontal assault into the teeth of the fortified rebel defenses, hoping this will be the last place an attack will be expected. His officers disagree. Nobody in the Army liked the thought of attacking Lee's position at Fredericksburg. But Burnside proceeded with his plan, issued the orders. When he did so, many men in his Army were, were just disgusted by the orders. Burnside was so incensed by this that he proceeded to lambast them uh, for their lack of cooperation. Uh, he told them that he didn't want their opinions. He just wanted them to obey. Unmoved by the protests from his officer corps, Burnside sets his plan in motion. Here's a man, Ambrose Burnside, who is naturally modest, who is naturally timid, and I, I believe that he may be overcompensating for that when he assumes this incredibly aggressive nature that, that overtakes him at Fredericksburg. I expect to be sacrificed tomorrow. Goodbye, old boy. And if tomorrow night finds me dead, remember me kindly as a soldier who meant to do his whole duty. Before dawn on December 11th, Union engineers quietly begin to assemble six pontoon bridges, struggling in vain to mask the sounds of their work. Within minutes, a messenger arrives at General Lee's headquarters with urgent news. The Yankees are trying to cross. A double cannon shot from the Confederate battery is followed by rebel yells along the banks in Fredericksburg. Confederate riflemen take aim across the river and transform the Union bridge builders into sitting ducks. Before long, blue uniformed bodies float downriver as the surviving engineers sprint for cover. The crossing 
is stopped in place. Burnside takes drastic action, directing artillery batteries on Stafford Heights to begin a massive bombardment of Fredericksburg. Union Army arrayed over 180 pieces of artillery along Stafford Heights, which up until our point in American history, that was the largest massing of artillery at any one certain location at any point and at any time. The main heavy artillery piece on both sides of the river is the 1857 model Napoleon cannon, a one-ton smooth-bore cannon that can throw a 12-pound shell more than a mile. Union batteries rain more than 5,000 shells onto Fredericksburg over the 10-hour barrage. Barrage was something that many of these men had never even imagined before. It was something that was immense in its fire, it was immense in its noise, it was immense in its destruction. A whole blocks of the city of Fredericksburg went up in flames. The soldiers were horrified. The bombardment was kept up for over an hour, and no tongue or pen can describe the dreadful scene. Tons of iron were hurled against the place. It was appalling and indescribable, a condition which would paralyze the stoutest heart. With Fredericksburg under siege, the few remaining residents flee in horror. Seeing the crumbling town, the Union bridge builders are ordered back to work. They nervously return to the pontoon construction. But hidden in the rubble, tenacious Confederate sharpshooters have ridden out the cannon's hellfire and emerge to exact a lethal payback. Late 1862, President Abraham Lincoln pushes for a Union victory before the winter. Union General Ambrose Burnside is forced to mount an attack on the town of Fredericksburg, Virginia. Confederate General Robert E. Lee monitors the Union troop movements. Burnside's plan is to build a series of six pontoon bridges and march his troops across the river and seize the town. The Union soldiers waited more than a week for the pontoon bridges to arrive. Now rebel sharpshooters are tearing apart the engineers trying to assemble the bridges. But Burnside is determined to push his army across the Rappahannock River and into Fredericksburg. So he orders a risky assault by boat. This was the very first riverine crossing under fire in American military history. No one had ever trained for it or prepared for it. Under heavy fire, two Union infantry regiments totaling nearly 2,000 men make it across the river, establish a small stronghold along the bank, and begin to push into town. By late afternoon, house-to-house -house fighting, the first urban combat of the Civil War, is raging. That was astonishing to everyone involved, to actually fight from house to house, street to street, block by block. Neither side prepared for that type of fighting. There was no training in that sort of thing. The Rebs opened on us from windows and doors and from behind the houses. We had no choice and after losing half our company, we made a rush for the houses and broke in doors. Within hours, the Union engineers managed to complete the first of the pontoon bridges. A full division of 5,000 of Burnside's troops rapidly cross into town. The streets are flooded with bluecoats. Seeing the Union onslaught, the Southerners defending the town rapidly flee.
They quickly join the forces in the fortified Confederate positions, strategically located in the hills that ring the town of Fredericksburg like an amphitheater. Now the last of the pontoon bridges are swiftly completed. The path for a full Union assault has finally been blazed. On the morning of December 12th, the Confederates secure their positions in the hills above Fredericksburg. While two of Burnside's three Grand Divisions march across the river, putting nearly 100,000 troops into the town. As they arrive, a mortician hands out business cards to the confident troops. Whomsoever would say to me at the time that anything else but certain victory awaited this army, I would have looked upon him with scorn and contempt. I was not aware that hell personified was so close at hand. From his headquarters on top of Telegraph Hill, Confederate General Robert E. Lee observes the size of the crossing and realizes that these troops represent the main force of Burnside's army. This is no diversion. I think Robert E. Lee was probably relieved because now he knew what was coming and where it was coming. And he was able to consolidate his forces. And, and I think he knew at that time that, that what was at hand was going to be a slaughter. Within Fredericksburg, Union troops have other priorities than battle. Small-time pilfering for food and tobacco escalates quickly into full-scale pillaging. Art, books, and furniture are smashed, tossed into the streets, and burned. The Union soldiers took out their anger and their fear and their frustration on the city of Fredericksburg. They looted and they plundered and they pillaged. Vandalism reigned supreme. Men who at home were modest and unassuming now seem to be possessed with an insatiate desire to destroy everything in sight. So it was a very bizarre and very just a shameful scene on the part of the Army of the Potomac. The conduct of our men and officers is atrocious. Their object seems to be to destroy what they can't steal and to steal all they can. As Fredericksburg becomes a spoil of war, back across the river, a meeting of Union commanders is held at Burnside's headquarters to firm up the attack plan. After a heated debate, a final strategy is set in motion. It essentially was a two-pronged frontal assault, which Burnside hoped just by sheer force of numbers would force the Confederates off that ridge. The first prong of the assault will be an attack on Prospect Hill at the far left of the Union lines. It is seen as an area where the Confederate Army is more vulnerable because the ridges are lower and accessible. General William Franklin is told that his 65,000 men must break through at Prospect Hill against General Stonewall Jackson's 49,000 troops. The attack is only hours away. The next morning, Stonewall Jackson's Second Corps braces for a massive Union assault. But General Franklin receives a vague written order from Burnside that seems to reverse the order for a large-scale attack on Prospect Hill. It commands him to take one division at least to assault Prospect Hill near Hamilton's Crossing. One division means attacking with just 4,000 men, less than 10% of the troops Franklin has ready to fight. When General Franklin received the order at 7.30, uh, what he read thoroughly perplexed him. Uh, it wasn't what he expected. He thought he was going to be the main attack, and he had 65,000 men ready to use. But the order he received told him to use just a division. Franklin has time to send a rider to Burnside for clarification, but decides not to. I think by the morning of December 13th, General Franklin was getting a little bit disgusted with General Burnside. What neither Franklin nor Burnside can know is that at that moment, in the Confederate commander's tent, a debate is raging which may change everything. There was a meeting of the high command of the Confederate armies. Robert E. Lee, James Longstreet, and Stonewall Jackson. And Stonewall Jackson rode up, you know, that morning and basically said, when do we attack? Stonewall Jackson was like a pit bull on a chain. 
This is a man who didn't understand defense. He didn't want to fight a defensive battle. That wasn't manly. Where's the honor in fighting a defensive battle? His mantra was attack, attack, attack. But Lee is able to quiet his fiery corps commander's aggression and convinces him to await the Yankees' first move. Jackson's wait will not be a long one. Just after 10 a.m., Franklin orders General George Meade to lead his division of 3,800 infantry into the field and attack Prospect Hill. For most Union troops, the fight is waged only with a single-shot rifle. But guns like the Springfield Model 1842 rifled musket represent a big advance over weapons of the late 18th and early 19th century. Its rifled barrel spins the projectiles on their way out, adding range, accuracy, and killing power. When Meade's troops near Confederate lines, they're taken by surprise. There seems to be a hidden Confederate artillery battery. Men and horses fall to the hidden guns, and the advance halts. Five hundred yards away, 24-year-old Confederate Major John Pelham directs just a single cannon. Pelham was at a great risk operating very far in front of his lines, but he handled it brilliantly. The unexpected presence of our guns so close to them seemed to paralyze them and throw them into disorder. Instead of rushing for us and overwhelming us with their numbers, they were evidently afraid of us, judging no doubt that we had a strong force concealed. For nearly an hour, Meade's men return fire and call for Union artillery to knock out what they believe to be four to eight guns firing on them. Finally, Pelham runs out of ammunition and is forced to retreat. No longer in Pelham's sights, Meade's men reorganize and prepare to assault Prospect Hill completely unaware that they are outnumbered 10 to 1. In the opening moments of the Battle of Fredericksburg, the first of the Union's dual assaults meets with stiff resistance. A single hidden Confederate cannon stops the division sent to probe Prospect Hill. At that moment, five miles to the north, Burnside's second prong, under the command of General Edwin Sumner, is preparing for the attack on Marie's Heights. The approach to the Confederate position offers little cover for the Union troops. The field outside of the town of Fredericksburg going up to Maurice Heights is roughly about a half a mile. So as soon as they passed out of the protection of the houses and the buildings of the town of Fredericksburg and entered into that open plain, they're gonna be under the fire of the guns. Midway across the field, a small canal must be crossed. Then a slight ridge offers the last protective cover before a low stone wall. And finally, a short march to the base of the heights. At 11 a.m., the Gibraltar Brigade, made up of troops led by Brigadier General Nathan Kimball, approaches the lower end of the canal. The attack is launched in wide Napoleonic columns, the standard tactic of the era. Troops march in two lines, sometimes over a hundred men across, just one foot behind the other. The Confederate soldiers, dug into the heights, wait for the impressive lines of Union troops to march into range. Federal troops expect most of the rebel cannon fire to be lobbed from behind the Confederate lines. Instead, artillery chief Porter Alexander has devised an innovative new way to position his guns. He brought them over the hill and put them on the downside and arranged them to repel any potential infantry assault up that hill. General Lee didn't like this. And finally, Porter Alexander says, General Lee, a chicken won't be able to live on that field when we open on it. Alexander was right. 
Confederate gun crews shred the Union troops, firing solid shot and explosive shells directly into the advancing waves. Once within a few hundred yards, an even more lethal munition awaits. Canister. Canister is basically a thin tin can, kind of like a coffee can. And inside the coffee can, you're going to put 27 inch and a half golf ball size lead balls. And you'll put that inside your cannon. You're basically turning your cannon into a giant shotgun. Five miles to the south at Prospect Hill, the second prong of Bluecoats is also approaching enemy lines. Having survived Pelham's cannon, George Meade's division is again on the move, advancing across the field toward rebel lines. Like at Marie's Heights, Confederate artillery crews are dug in and ready. To calculate a deadly kill zone, a lone tree 800 yards out has been measured for the cannons to set their range. A raise of the hand as the fatal tree is reached, and the 14 guns let loose at the same instant. From then on, it's load and fire, load and fire, load and fire as fast as sponge and rammer and lanyard can do their work. Fire! The brutal rain of shot and shells stalls Meade's advance. Back at Marie's Heights, the Gibraltar Brigade has lost nearly one-third of their men before the final crest in the field. But the troops stay in rank and continue forward. As they clear the final rise and approach the stone wall, one more surprise awaits. Behind the wall, hundreds of Confederate shooters under General Thomas Cobb load their rifles. They could see the Confederate artillery on top of Marie's Heights and thought that was their target. But as they closed to within about 100 yards of the base of that hill, they were stunned to see an entire line of Confederate infantry stand up from a sunken road and fire into their face. It never dawned on them that there was an entire infantry brigade standing right in front of them. The sheet of flame emanating from that stone wall stopped the Federals dead in their tracks. Against these thousands of rifles, all neatly protected by the stone wall, there almost was no defense. The Federals had no cover. The destruction of the Gibraltar Brigade is complete. From the edge of town, the renowned Irish Brigade witnessed the slaughter under the heights. On command, they fix bayonets and march forward to reinforce the embattled divisions already in the field. Their fortitude is matched by that of the small division back at Prospect Hill, who at the same moment are attempting yet another assault. At this point of the Battle of Prospect Hill, it's, it's just chaos. All three of George Meade's commanders are out of action. One of them's dead, one of them's wounded, and the other one's pinned under a horse and can't get up. And so the men are basically leading themselves. As Meade's outnumbered troops close on Confederate lines, some of his men cross through an undefended area thought by rebels to be an impassable marsh. When men are desperate for cover, they go into the woods and they begin to filter up. And much to the surprise of the Confederates, it was not impassable at all. When the Union Army hit the swamp and were able to penetrate into the gap of Stonewall Jackson's line, they were pointed straight at Maxie Gregg. Confederate Brigadier General Maxie Gregg's South Carolina Brigade is charged with holding 600 yards of ground behind the swamp. Unaware of Meade's attack, his men sit eating lunch. When Gregg saw the troops coming up the hill, he assumed that they were going to be Confederates, when in reality they were Federals. Shots crack through the trees. The men run to their guns and fire at the figures spotted in the distance through the woods. Gregg is certain that the men are firing at their own Confederate skirmishers and rides along his lines urgently yelling to cease fire. By the time he discovered his mistake, it was too late. A Union round catches Maxie Gregg in the spine. His misjudgment has cost him his life and leaves his troops without a leader. Meade's men rout the Confederate defenders and breach Stonewall Jackson's line. With the battlefield in chaos, with nothing being planned, you don't want to use the word miracle, but I can't think of another one. 
With just 4,000 men, George Meade has penetrated a wall of more than 40,000 Confederate defenders at Prospect Hill. Remarkably, one phase of Burnside's brazen plan has broken through. On Marie's Heights, the Union troops are being slaughtered by Confederate rifles. Rebel General James Longstreet is confident he can hold this position indefinitely. But surprisingly, at Prospect Hill, on their second attempt of the day, Union General George Meade's troops are able to pierce the formidable defenses. George Gordon Meade led probably the smallest division in the entire Union Army in that attack against Stonewall Jackson. His success was something that must have startled everyone, not only in the Confederate lines, but also in the Union lines. And his success was a one in a million chance. But outnumbered 10 to one, Meade cannot hold out for long on his own. Now at this point, with Stonewall Jackson's front line on the verge of crumbling, Meade knows that he can take this line. He needs help. He asked an aide to go find the closest troops available and bring them up. His plea reaches General David Burney. Shockingly, Burney refuses to send in more troops. And instead, what he got was a great big dose of who made you the boss of me. This is a guy who said, I don't work for you. You're a division commander, I'm a division commander. We're in two different corps. I take my orders from somebody else. Now, George Meade was a man with one of the most ferocious tempers in either army. At this point, he went back to find Bernie himself. He proceeded to yell and scream at Bernie, chewing him up and down to the point where a witness said to listen to Meade was enough to make the stones underfoot almost creep, trying to get away. I'm surprised George Gordon Meade didn't pull out a pistol and shoot the guy. As Meade rages, he may be the only federal commander who realizes what history will soon confirm. In one moment of fateful hesitance, all chance at a Union victory has vanished. On top of Prospect Hill, Stonewall Jackson directs two divisions to spearhead the Confederate counterattack and close the fractured defensive line. Soon it's every man for himself, outgunned and drastically outnumbered. Meade's troops sprint back toward the main Union lines, pursued by thousands of Confederate soldiers. In no time, Meade's men surrender every inch they've gained, leaving hundreds of their dead and wounded in the woods behind them. Their dramatic breakthrough yields little except for unanswered questions about what could have been achieved. Now, once Meade broke through, and if Franklin had shown any great initiative and moved up with reinforcements immediately, uh, the Federals would have been able to consolidate everything that Meade had captured. Had they stayed on the Confederate right flank, there's a good chance they could have made the entire line untenable for Robert E. Lee. There was a real chance at Union victory. But up the lines at Marie's Heights, there's no time for analysis. The battle still rages. The Irish Brigade, made up of mostly Irish immigrants from New York, Massachusetts, and Pennsylvania, is the 5th Brigade sent against the Heights. One of their number, William McCarter from the 116th Pennsylvania Volunteers, describes their advance as it reaches the small ridge in the center of the field. Every third man had fallen, and along some parts of the line, every second soldier had been killed or wounded. To make matters still worse, we had lost nearly all our officers. They took instant and overwhelming losses across the board. Uh, the bloodbath was terrible. And it was showing that the old form of fighting was quickly becoming a thing of the past. You see individuals, commanders, as well as common soldiers saying, this does not make sense. This long lines marching up to one another and duking it out. 
The Irish Brigade battles to within 50 yards of the sunken road before it is destroyed completely. Survivors run for a shallow ravine that is already choked with hundreds of Union wounded. 545 men from the brigade are lost, joining the thousands of dead and wounded that have already fallen. Those fortunate enough to be carried off the battlefield soon find themselves at one of the dozens of makeshift Union field hospitals. Fredericksburg was transformed in one vast hospital. Just about every residence, uh, church, civic building that was still standing was converted into a hospital. Ghastly and bloody wounds met the eye in every direction. Some had their eyes shot out. The tongues of some were swollen out of their mouths. Some had their bodies shot through. Others were torn and mangled by shell and shot. And all were crowded wherever there was any space. Atop Telegraph Hill, Robert E. Lee grows worried that Burnside's masses of human wave attacks may ultimately break through Longstreet's formidable defensive positions. But Longstreet's confidence in his men is unshakable. General, if you put every man now on the other side of the Potomac in that field to approach me over the same line and give me plenty of ammunition, I will kill them all before they reach my line. But as the attacks continued to roll forward one after another after another, Robert E. Lee started seeing a different aspect of the battlefield that he hadn't encountered before, and that was the destructive power of his own men. Uh, to look at the pristine Union legions of the morning come back tattered and ruined and broken and bleeding, that truly affected him and probably affected him for the rest of his life. In response to Longstreet's morbid boasts, Lee said, it is well that war is so terrible, or we should grow too fond of it. Across the Rappahannock at Burnside's headquarters, Generals Edwin Sumner and Joseph Hooker press the Union commander to end the slaughter. The conversation between Hooker and Burnside was not at all pleasant. Hooker was a very outspoken man. Uh, he didn't like Burnside, Burnside didn't like him, and General Hooker made it very clear that Burnside should not make these assaults. Burnside was a somewhat inflexible man, a somewhat stubborn man, and as the going got tough, Burnside simply decided to up the ante. Generations of historians have spent their lives trying to figure out what in the world was Ambrose Burnside thinking. It's a difficult question to answer. The man is sleep deprived for one thing. Uh, he is probably a little bit delusional. The attacks on Marie's Heights would continue. One of Sumner's commanders, General Darius Couch, witnesses the result from an observation post in the courthouse tower. The whole plain was covered with men, prostrate and dropping, the live men running here and there, and in front closing upon each other, and the wounded coming back. The command seemed to be mixed up. I had never before seen fighting like that. Nothing approaching it in terrible uproar and destruction. In all, 15 brigades are sent to their destruction before sun sets on the killing fields. Not a single Yankee reaches the sunken road. With nightfall on December 13th, the futile Union attacks on the Confederate strongholds around Fredericksburg finally halt. Thousands of dead, dying, and wounded Union troops lay across the battlefield. For the Confederate troops watching and listening, the night is one that will remain etched in their minds. 
If you were a Confederate soldier looking out across that field as the fighting sputtered to an end on December 13th, it would have been a terribly gruesome sight. You would have had hundreds of Union soldiers lying in all um, uh, attitudes of pain on the ground, some with heads blown off, others with wounds to their arms, some groaning, uh, some trying to crawl to safety. When night descended upon the bloody field, nearly 1,500 dead soldiers lay in an area of two acres in front of our lines. Three or four times as many wounded held in the darkness, a dismal concert for assistance which could not be rendered, or they perished in the cold from neglect. Shots and artillery are exchanged wildly in the dark. The wounded use the dead as human shields. Union recovery teams brave the blind volleys to pull their casualties off the field. A half mile away in his headquarters on Telegraph Hill, Robert E. Lee assesses the situation. Some of his commanders press for a counterattack to finish off the Army of the Potomac. But in spite of having crushed every Union unit sent against him, the Confederate leader is not convinced that the Union Army has abandoned their offensive. Both Union and Confederate soldiers were under the impression that what had ended on December 13th would almost certainly begin again on December 14th. Nobody was under the impression that this battle was over, least of all General Burnside and Robert E. Lee. Lee's instincts are correct. Across the river, Burnside is laying out his plan to seize victory from ghastly defeat with a final all-out assault. But this attack is going to be a little bit different. This time, Burnside planned to attack with his own old Ninth Corps, which he's going to mass them into a very compact formation. Burnside's intention is to create a colossal block of infantry, hundreds of men wide and 36 lines deep. It is an idea that is both daring and desperate. In the hope of getting a few hundred men past the stone wall, Burnside is willing to sacrifice thousands more. One man, almost certain to fall, will be the officer leading the charge, Burnside himself. I think Burnside was so distraught by what he had seen on December 13th and felt so guilty about it that he, this was Burnside's way of trying to end his own life. Burnside's men are finally able to reason with their commander, and they talk him out of his reckless final maneuver. And thousands are saved from needless slaughter. Dawn on December 14th brings skirmishes and artillery, but no further attack. For the wounded abandoned in front of the stone wall, it also means another day of agony. These men had bled, they were thirsty, they were crying out for water, and yet nobody could go to help them because to step out on that no man's ground was essentially to commit suicide. Finally, one soldier couldn't take it any longer. Richard Kirkland, a 19-year-old Confederate sergeant manning the sunken road cannot stand the anguish he sees among the Union wounded stretched out in front of him. He asked for permission to take water out into no man's land and give it to the Union soldiers. His commanders thought that that would be a suicidal mission, but he undertook it anyway. At the risk of his own life, he leaped over the wall, dodged some bullets until he reached the very first soldier. At that point, he knelt down, gave the man a drink of water out of one of the canteens he was carrying. The firing halts quickly, as exhausted soldiers on both sides watch in awe the bold display of compassion amid the slaughter. A day later, under cover of a blinding rain and sleet, the Union Army completes a miraculous silent retreat across the river. They escape undetected, saving the remainder of the Union Army of the Potomac. In Fredericksburg, and in the hospitals and fields outside the town, more than 13,000 Union casualties lie wounded or dead. Confederates tally their wounded and dead at 5,300. In spite of their casualties, the rebel troops are exultant. They've dealt the Union Army another grave blow. They thought they were invincible. They were unbeatable. Uh, in the future, one more victory, Maybe the Southern Confederacy would be a reality. Ironically, in victory, Lee misses a chance to deal the Army of the Potomac a mortal blow. Lee could have damaged the Army much more than he did had he simply shelled the town of Fredericksburg. It was a very small place, 
packed from end to end with troops, and if Lee had unleashed his artillery on the town on December the 14th, there would have been thousands of more casualties. Following the Battle of Fredericksburg, President Lincoln downplays the defeat by saying the number of casualties is comparatively low. General Burnside, living up to his own feelings of incompetence, is relieved of his command of the Army of the Potomac. His replacement is General Joseph Hooker, Burnside's rival since their days together at West Point. The soldiers and generals at Fredericksburg cannot know that the future of warfare has been revealed among the fighting of the past days. Amphibious assaults and grim urban fighting will become deadly fixtures of war in the next century. And the cost of pitting outdated tactics against modern weaponry will be tragically relearned in the trenches of World War I. But what is clear to the men who survived this battle is that many rules of engagement and civility have been smashed forever on this battlefield. I believe that the Battle of Fredericksburg is the moment at which the American Civil War became notoriously uncivil. I believe that this is the moment that these two armies grew to hate each other, grew to think of each other as barbarians. The period on the end of the Battle of Fredericksburg is Stonewall Jackson looking at the destruction of the town. Somebody asked him, how do we deal with such barbaric acts? Stonewall Jackson said, kill them. Kill them all. If you're eager to see more of our historical documentaries, please like, share, and subscribe.